And it's a pleasure to welcome, welcome to the library, Carl Stalker, um, who is known to many of you. I know there's a, a quite a lot of Carl Stalker fan club in tonight, so you're all welcome. Um, <laughs> Carl is a, um, American by origin, but Florentine by adoption. He's living here permanently now. Um, he's the uh, curator emeritus from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, but um, more recently has been doing some work over at Itati, where he did the catalog of the Bernard Berson collection. And he told me his most recent uh, major project was a Fra Angelico uh, exhibition at the Prada Museum in Madrid. So he's a, um, a practicing man of the arts. And tonight he's going to tell us all about the Berisons, which he's obviously is a world expert on. So Carl, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I got permission to take this off and I'm going to give myself permission to take this off because I think this is the only warm spot in all of Florence. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that. It's very a great pleasure to be able to talk at the British Council about the Baronsons because even though both Baronsons were American, they had a really strong ties to Great Britain, particularly to England, uh, London, Oxford and Surrey, as we shall see tonight. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Bernard and Mary Barons. And you said it was the Bernard Baronson collection. I would like to emphasize that's actually the Bernard and Mary Baronson collection. And tonight's talk will be really about their relationship, how they met on, uh, you know, suddenly fell in love. It's like when the uh, flowers come out on the prunus plant in the spring, all of a sudden something happened. And it's that electricity that really created um, the, um, Itati, as we know it today, which is the great research center for Italian Renaissance um, culture and art and many other things as well. And this is the main room of the, of the library as it is used today. It was the library that was actually built during their time. Um, and I'd like to also emphasize that the Itati was given to Harvard University which was the um, alum, uh, which was the alma mater of both Bernard and Mary Berenson. Oftentimes we think of a, a Bernard having graduated from Harvard University, which he did indeed do in 1887 after first studying at Boston University. He wasn't able to take a Sanskrit course, so he went to Harvard to do that and transfer it over. Whereas Mary, who started her education, uh, which never finished except during the course of her life, one might say, uh, at Smith College, she was from Philadelphia, but she attended the annex for about one academic year. The annex was then the female section of Harvard University, it didn't really get off. And later it became Radcliffe College, which was for a long time, the uh, women's college associated with Harvard and Cambridge. I'm going to talk tonight and uh, using this chronology of their relationship and their meeting as a structure for the uh, lecture. So essentially their brief meeting in London in 1888. And then when Bernard passes a weekend with Mary and Frank because uh, Mary was actually married to someone called Frank as we shall see in Surrey in August in 1890. And Mary and Frank joining Bernard for Christmas here in Florence in 1890. And I'll talk about Florence during that year. Mary, Bernard, Mary and Bernard working together in, in Italy for about a decade. And then finally uh, set, getting married a decade after their re relationship began in uh, December 1900 and renting Itati and beginning to make a collection of art to decorate Itati. In fact, collection sometimes is a wrong word. They bought their pictures for the house. First though, let's start with two young mothers writing each other. Mothers are Mary, Mary uh, at this point is Mary Costello with Ray, her uh, firstborn daughter born in 1887 and Gertrude Hitz Burton, her great, great friend who was from Washington DC. Both of people, both women were uh, feminists and they were very, very bored with their marriage their various marriages. In fact, Gertrude uh, camp, decamped, uh, her husband left him in uh, America and was living in Paris at that time. And Mary just was having a lot of trouble um, being a housewife strapped with a baby at home. So 
Uh, these are the husbands. Uh, Frank Costello was Mary's husband. He was an Irish barrister whom she met in America and a member of the London City Council. Whereas Gertrude's husband, who became very prominent actually after Gertrude's death, Alfred Edward Burton, was an engineer and professor at MIT, and then later its first dean. Um, and Ma Gertrude introduces Mary uh, to Bernard, whom she has met in Paris. Bernard is a recent graduate of Harvard College. He's spending a year abroad, which is being financed by some uh, worthy Bostonians. I believe he's a genius, but I love him for his beautiful personality. And our friendship is as close as the friendship of two girls and seems to belong to another age. It is so spontaneous, so lofty, and so tender. Well, this uh, introduction kind of attracted Mary uh, um, uh, to that, um, Bernard, and she uh, wrote him when she found out he was actually in England. I've just heard from Mrs. Burton that you were in England now, and since London is the center of England, there will be a chance of my meeting you. And she actually specifies, oh, you can come for dinner at such and such a date. Gertrude says you were probably at Oxford. Tis one of the loveliest places in the world. I wonder if America will ever produce a place like it. Uh, in fact, uh, Bernard was at Oxford. He had hoped to uh, meet Walter Pater, but Walter Pater, a uh, great writer, uh, didn't really want to meet Bernard Barrens. Anyways, uh, Bernard was uh, staying at that point at 31 Hollywell Street in Oxford. And whereas the uh, um, Costello House, was right behind Victoria Station, essentially, in Grosvenor Road, Pimlico. And Bernard was staying with Edward Wen Penn Warren, who was a Bostonian, his partner, John Marshall. And I always get a little mixed up looking at this photograph that I can't tell uh, Ed from John. I think it's much easier to tell the, the, the two terriers apart. Anyways, they were a, a, a homosexual couple. And people sometimes ask me, well, was did Bernard, Bernard have homosexual leanings? Um, I don't think actually so. He had, like a lot of people coming out of college, very deep friendships with his male friends, particularly coming from uh, Harvard Co College, which is then a completely uh, a male college. And all those type of male friendships so fizzled over the course of the, the next decade, and he lar largely lived, I'd say, in a female world. But if these men uh, uh, admired him, he wasn't going to make a fuss about it. And particularly Edward Penn Warren, who, along with Isabella Stewart Gardner, the great Bostonian collector, actually paid for his scholarship abroad. And when that ran out, Ed Warren, besides also inviting him at the house in Oxford, um, uh, gave him money for the next year, gave him a renewal of the scholarship. So you appreciate people like that. Um, Meanwhile, in London, Mary is really getting fed up with her husband. It was wicked beyond words for us, Mary and Frank, to dream of having a child if we were not prepared to give up something for it. He's not prepared to give up any of his activities or pursuits. And of course, I am dragged along in his wake. I cannot live a separate life. And in fact, shortly after she wrote that in her diary, in March 1889, Karen, the second child, was born, a child whom she had a terrible relationship for the whole, whole of her life. Here are Mary and the girls, Ray and Karen, several years later. I actually don't know the date of the photograph. But Frank's pursuits are described in a letter dated London, 25 January 18. 1889, to the uh, Smith family's greatest friend. Mary was born, um, um, uh, Mary Whittle uh, Smith, and uh, their best friend, her father's best friend was American poet Walt Whitman. And she frequently corresponded with him. This correspondence is not a tati, but it's in the Walt Whitman archive. Um, and Mary explains some of Frank's work to, uh, to um, um, Walt Whitman, the poet, about the London City Council, which is actually a new organization. It didn't really exist much before this. And, and Frank had been elected in during one of the uh, first uh, um, uh, campaigns uh, to elect members from London. And he says two women have been elected as well in this. But by a curious and very Englishly mandate, it is quite uncertain whether they are really qualified to serve or not. A petition has been filed against Lady Sandhurst. And Frank hopes to expend some of his legal knowledge on the case, of course, in favor of the woman. 
uh, um, Frank was a member of the Progressive Party, as was Lady Sandhurst, and the one other female woman elected, Jane Cobb. Cobden. Um, Margaret Mansfield, Baroness Sandhurst, was the uh, got the most votes for her part of town, South Kensington, uh, but um, she was never able to be seated. In other words, a man uh, won the case and he was seated, whereas Jane Cobden was seated but was not allowed to vote, so it was essentially a, a mute um, a, a rep representation. But this cartoon, which I think is from punch, you can see that indeed among all these men shouting at each other, there are two women who are Lady Sandhurst and Mrs. and Miss Coben. Frank was very involved with all the great questions of the time. And Mary liked this at first because she was very much like her mother, a, 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 quite a bit of a, a feminist, and also believed in the home rule for Ireland and campaigned throughout the British Isles on this. This is a photograph of the two of them with other friends at a demonstration for the home rule. And this is also a part of their life together is that thanks to Mary's brother, who is Logan Purcell Smith, they frequently wrote uh, uh, theatricals and perform them at their house in the country in Surrey. So here you see uh, one called Durver's uh, College for Ladies, written by Mary's brother. And I pointed out where Ray, the firstborn daughter is, and that is Frank in the background. This photograph was taken uh, shortly after, that was taken in September, and shortly after a weekend in Surrey in August, 1890. So you have to imagine of uh, um, Bernard Berenson was invited to come from uh, London to Surrey this weekend. And he started off at Waterloo Station, which in 1890 looked a little bit different than it does today. I think it's a post um, Edwardian period building part largely. Uh, went through the station, picked up his ticket. And then he finally arrived at Hazelmere Station, which was about uh, two, three miles away from Friday's Hill, which was the house where the um, Smith family, uh, Mary's parents, who had came to England from America to be with her and um, uh, were living on weekends. They also had stayed in London and there were several other houses around there. So Frank and Frank uh, and Mary also had a cottage on, on the property. Next door neighbor was Alfred Lord Tennyson. And another neighbor, but also really, which you might call a paying guest, was Bertrand Russell, who was very fascinated by the atmosphere at Friday's Hill. And he actually, uh, the um, future philosopher, uh, actually uh, married Mary's sister, Elise, in 1894 in a Quaker ceremony because the uh, um, Smith family, Mary's family, the Smiths and the Logans were uh, Quakers. In fact, uh, her ancestors, her ancestor uh, was um, William Penn's secretary when they came to um, Philadelphia, America. Uh, always present also was a person we had met before, Mary and Elise's brother, Logan Purcell Smith, who became a well-known literary critic. And uh, there's a room at Itati, sometimes called Logan's room, which was the quarters where he stayed at, frequently visiting Itati over the years. The house, it doesn't really look like it in this photograph, but apparently had 14 bedrooms. I don't know how many bathrooms, but legions of death guests came every weekend. And it had, was known for its intellectual atmosphere. So the reactions to Barons in that first Friday to Monday, as weekends then were called, which was four, one to four August 1890, were quite varied. One unnamed elderly man called him a young whippersnapper and really hated it, in fact, that he asserted the moon was more beautiful through the trees than sailing across a clear sky. So I looked up what the moon phases were in that uh, uh, particular weekend. And I noticed on Thursday, uh, um, the day before, the last day of July, it was a full moon. But then there was still over that weekend this, this almost full moon. And you can just imagine that maybe Mary, uh, Mrs. Costello, and Bernard Baronson taking a walk out there and looking at the moon through those lovely uh, trees and, and beginning to fall in love with us. Mary's father, Robert Percy Smith, called him simply a penniless bohemian. He was just couldn't get 
a hold of this man who he didn't like at all. And Robert Purcell Smith was an evangelical preacher. He had left Quakerism to become an evangelical preacher. He got uh, in trouble at one point for sexual harassment of a rather severe sort and gave up his preaching, but uh, um, stayed with his family. And the money, which was Mary's, Mary inherited some of this money as well and allowed her a certain amount of independence, particularly from her husband at a later date, was from the Whittle, Whittle Tantum Company in New Jersey, which is the first industrial company of glass production in America. And, um, and begun in, by uh, uh, Robert's uh, um, ancestors, and they specialize in apothecary bottles. Mary's mother, unlike, uh, as it happens frequently, the woman liked uh, Berenson more than the, uh, than the men and called him a young genius. And she wrote something rather interesting about his talk of paintings. He demolished the idols of the young people who were staying that weekend. He proved by the most masterly system of criticism that most of the old pictures that they were that they admired were either bad originals or bad copies, and swept away into a place of contempt all the modern painters. Turner, Burne Jones, Rossetti, the new German school. This is all rubbish for Berenson. And they were rather shocked because they thought themselves quite modern and quite up to date. And these are the artists that they liked. But Berenson was not completely against uh, uh, modern art. In fact, on his notes going through Italy, through Europe, into museums and churches, he frequently made comparisons of pictures to modern painters of his time. And the one he liked the best was Whistler, as you can see here. He compares his painting, which was formerly attributed to Lorenzo Lotto, one of his great favorites, uh, to a Whistler. Three little sketches in oil I only showed. One that might be by Whistler or any great modern. Well, old fashioned technique. If you like the wife, make friends with the husband. I don't know this from personal experience, but over the last two years, I've, I've been um, seen a lot of Netflix. And uh, <laughs> so that happens frequently. And Mary's husband was Frank Costello, we've met before, and they became, he became briefly, very briefly, friends with Bernard. Excuse me. Mistake here. And Mary, in a letter to Walt Whitman Day uh, towards the end of the year, remember they met in August, uh, goes, Frank and I are going to spend our Xmas hall, Christmas holiday at Rome if all goes well. In fact, it did go well. And in 1890, they were going to Rome. I mean, Rome, but also first floors. In that autumn of 1890, Charles Lerzer, or Loiser, the, the great collector, and Bernard's Harvard classmate, uh, he and, and Bernard were roommates together, roomed together at the Palazzo Spini Ferrone, which is now known as Ferragamo, of course, but which at that point had the Visser Library in it and also lots of rooms which were rented to cultural people later when uh, Oscar Wilde rented rooms there as well. And uh, Lerzer was a very wealthy. He was the son of a, a department store owner in Brooklyn. And I have a feeling he was probably financing this fine set of rooms. Let's talk a little bit about Florence in 1890. What did the Baronsons find there here? This is a nice photograph and I like it a lot because it shows that Donatello's Judith was then in the Loggia dei Lanzi. On uh, New Year's Day, uh, 1890, so in other words, about a year before they came here. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of things that happened in this neighborhood. So right behind uh, our British Institute on the Via Santo Spirito, there's a high school, which is called Palazzo Rinuncini, but has actually one of the prettiest theaters in all of Florence there. And they had a, quite a good program of prose, of theatrical performance. And on that New Year's Day, was uh, they put on Sardo's Fedora, which uh, was, of course, a play that had been a tour de force of Sarah Bernhardt and Eleonora Duz. I do not know who was playing it that night. On that same, earlier that same day, they took away uh, John Bologna's bronze satire from the Palazzo Vecchietti near the Palazzo um, Strozzi, and this is now in the Museo Bardini. 
one of the re and we'll see why. Later in March, Buffalo Bill came to Florence and he arrived on a special train and all the uh, American Indian performers camped out in the meadow near the, the Torre della Zecca, which is now near the Viale. These are actually show photographs of the um, done in Rome, by, and including one of Annie Oakley. My vow is loved because uh, my uncle uh, learned how to shoot from her when he was a little boy. Uh, I'm just showing this because Buffalo Bill is kind of interesting that he had come up from Florence, uh, from Rome, where he had met the Pope. At his request, he later became a, a deathbed convert. And he also uh, challenged the Butere of Latina, and they beat the American Broncos in a show in the Prati. The Prati then in Rome was still the Prati. In other words, it was still largely meadows and not developed. Mm. At this time, while they were there performing at the Zecca, in, by March 22nd, the uh, demolition of the Mercato Vecchio was completed. Berenson saw it before. Uh, this is another view of it during its yeah. destruction, which is kind of terrible to look at. And Berenson saw it before, and he remembered six years later in his diary that he remarked on the tragedy of the demolition of Mercato Vecchio, calling it the most beautiful and characteristic product of popular Florentine art in a complex of bulk and shape. Um, at the same time, around 22nd, 22nd of March, the Principessa Strozzi is said to be terribly sick. This is the sort of thing that the newspapers had at that time. They reported everything that the various Principessa of Florence were doing, even when they were ill. And But who could blame her? Because right there outside her window, they were destroying the um, Mercato uh, Vecchio, the whole center of Florence. And there must have been terrible noise and dust. But it's also a time of mass tourism. From the Nazion, I learned that on April 7th, 70 Americans arrived as a comitivo from Venice and they lodge at the Grand Hotel Porto Rosa. And on May 1st, they started the Esposizione Beatrice in honor of Beatrice, in other words, Dante's Beatrice at the Politeema Fiorentino Vittorio Emanuele, in which they recreated Florence that had just been destroyed in the center of town. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, Politeama is actually what was known for many years and beloved by many of us as the Teatro Comunale. Uh, here you can see a 19th century view of it, um, which at that point, it didn't have a roof. It was only roofed in 1893. And of course, it recently lost its roof again. Um, on June 8th, we have three days of celebrations for the new monument to Garibaldi, which is now near, which is then also where the American Council is. And at that time, all the po Zone Popolare of Florence, they put up decorations in honor of Garibaldi and the mayor, the first elected mayor of Florence before they were appointed, Francesco Guicciardini, went with the school children to see the decorations right down the street from here in San Ferdiano. On the same day at the Mostra Beatrice, which was dedicated to a uh, woman, uh, Vittorio Vecchi, who was known as Jack La Bolina, who wrote uh, marine adventure stories, gave a talk on Garibaldi's woman, and particularly on Anita Garibaldi. Um, in Fie on the 19th of September, which is very important for Berenson later because they always took the tram, uh, there was a new tram from the Piazza San Marco to Fiesle is inaugurated, and it took only 20 minutes. This is something, as I say, uh, it takes a lot longer to take the bus seven now. On that very same day, in behind here in the Via dei Sorali, in the Palazzo um, um, Antinore dei Duchi di Brindisi, um, the Maria, Antu uh, Maria Antinore and Giuseppe Aldo Brandini, the Roman prince, got signed their marriage contract. The biggest parties then for uh, uh, aristocratic marriages were not actually the marriage ceremony, but the signing of the contract. We settle all, all the thing about property and in the presence of a large contingent of Florentine and Roman nobility. And from exile in Austria, the ex Grand Duchess of Tuscany, Maria Antonia, uh, set a diamond and sa sapphire bracelet. Um, 
the uh, Antonori family maintained the administration for the exiled uh, Grand Dukes of Lorraine here in Florence. But at that very wedding on that same day, a lot of them couldn't show up at the wedding and they're all mentioned in the newspapers, the reason why. And the reason why is that they all had to be at the station, uh, which was used to be called the Ex Stazione Maria Antonia, was now simply called the Stazione after the exile of, of the Lorraines in 1859. And at uh, 1730, uh, the King, Queen, the Prince of Piemonte uh, arrive. And so they had to, all the uh, various people had to greet them. Here you have the names of, of the mayor, uh, the prime minister, the prefetto, uh, Domenico Berti and various other people, all the important people had to leave the wedding or not show up at the wedding and go to the stazione, where of course the mayor and all these other men could compare mustaches <laughs> with the king. Yeah. Uh, the woman too, 17 noble women came to the station, many of them directly from the wedding, uh, and uh, they uh, came and they kissed the, 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 um, kissed the hand of the king. At that point, if you were a king, you got your hand kissed. A group of school girls from Fiesley came with flowers with their teacher to greet the queen and invite her to come and try out the new tram to Fiesley, which she agreed to do. But they were talking so much to the queen that the queen's lady in waiting, uh, 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 Pignatelli, uh, said, please don't bother anymore. But the king allowed the girls to get into a landau and follow the royal possession uh, downtown. This shows them coming out, not them, but a, a view of Via Panzani where they would have passed through town. On the 20th September, in the newly uh, cleared out Piazza uh, Vittorio Emanuele, not Piazza della Repubblica, they inaugurated the uh, monument to Vittorio Emanuele, the first king of United Italy. The king and queen were going indeed, as I said, take the tram up to Fiesole on the 24th, but it derailed on the 23rd and it killed five people. And it was various descriptions, the people who were eating at the Aurora restaurant actually shouted. They saw there's it's too crowded. The train is going, the tram's going too fast down the hill. And when it went around the curve to San Michele, which was then a private, which is a hotel now, but private villa called San Michele Dolce, it derailed. And so the king and queen, they did go to see the wounded in uh, um, Santa Maria Nuova, and but they had come up with something else to do. So the king came to this area of town again, and he went over to uh, see the Casa Popular at the corner of the Via Pisana and Via Monte Oliveto, and the newspaper records all these wonderful <laughs> conversations he had with the various people who got to uh, be in the, via, in the new Casa, um, Casa Popular. In fact, here you can see the lower edge here had just been built at that time, whereas the other part had been built in the uh, about a decade before. Uh, the new part had been built thanks to um, the direction of Carlo um, Ginori, who was uh, in charge of the Casa Popolare at that point in Florence. And the queen and said, you know, she doesn't go to the Casa Popolare and she takes a museum visit and she goes to see the newly inaugurated Museo dell'Opera del Duomo and particularly the Cantoria. The Cantoria had been in fragmented state and had been at the Bargello before. And the Ministry of Culture, much to the Bargello's disgust, decided that they would be sent over to the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo and recomposed there. And the man who did it, the architect Luigi del Moro, was the one who finished the facade of the Cathedral of Florence, uh, was the one who uh, uh, so put back together the Cantoria and showed the Queen those uh, that particular day. Moving along the year on the 12th of October, 500 people were not all kings and queens in Florence and a lot of people, including the mayor, were anti-Savoy and anti-monarchist. And the uh, liberal politician Felice Cavallotti came and was given a dinner for 500 people in the Moorish Pleasure Garden, Piazza Baccaria doesn't exist anymore, which was called El Hambra. Mm -hmm. Later uh, on that same month, the Empress Sisi comes to, of Austria comes and stays at the new hotel, Grand Hotel de la Ville, 
now the Excelsior, but she comes as the Countess Nicholson and is asked not to be recognized on the street and refuses any letters that are addressed to her Imperial Majesty. At that point, Frank and Mary come on 6 a.m. on the morning train, night train rather, from, um, from uh, Milan uh, and on the 23rd, and they go and stay in the same flat with Bernard and Charles, uh, Bernard Barons and Charles Lurzer, and that very afternoon they go to the Uffizi. And on the day of their arrival in Florence, but they don't go, they go, or could have gone to see Mascagni's new opera, The Cavaliero Rusticana in the Teatro Pagliano, which is now the Teatro Verdi. But on Christmas Eve, they go, uh, uh, Mary writes to her little girl at, back at, at home, um, I send thee a postcard, thee, she always uses the Quaker thee, a postcard with a Santa Claus gave to Bernard Berenson. She I always wrote it like that, for thee. And Bernard Berenson sends it to thee with a kiss. We had a long walk today and we looked at a great many pictures painted by a man named Botticelli. Make grandma teach thee that name. <laughs> And Botticelli was not the Uffizi at that point. Botticelli was then at the Galleria dell'Accademia. I don't have any installation view of the Botticelli room, but uh, it was right off these rooms where you can see the Zagiato and the Cimabue and more of the, uh, uh, the Primitivi, the gold grounds were kept at that point. On Christmas day, Mary and Bird take a walk in the Cascine, as we can see from her diary. And then they go in early January, they go to Rome where there's this blanketing, Rome had a big snowstorm then. And it was kind of wonderful to see Rome at that point in the snowstorm. And they seem to have had quite a bit of fun because of that very reason, but they of course did a lot of tourism as well. But at one point they go up to the Aventine Hill where they have the garden of the, uh, of the Knights of Malta, the famous view of which shows the St. Peter's under the snow and uh, they almost kiss, but they don't kiss because there's Frank is there with them. Um, <laughs> and then the Mary's appointment books mentions the last drive with BB, though I don't know whether Frank was on it, on the Appian Way before they leave Rome on the 947 train back to England. By the spring, though, Mary and, Fra uh, and Bernard become lovers. Dear, I woke up at two o'clock last night trembling. I remembered and lived over again everything. How I love the, uh, how I love the, I dream of it all the time line. And one of the first things they do as uh, they go visit Lady Eastlake. Lady Eastlake was the widow of Lord Eastlake who had been the uh, great director of the National Gallery in London, a great collector of paintings, who was responsible for many of the early Italian paintings that went to the National Gallery of London. And uh, Lady Eastlake was a great connoisseur herself, and she told us of tales of picture hunts and out of way places in Italy, of their early visits to Italy. And Bernard and I looked at each other with shining eyes, and that confirmed in each of us the secret resolution to follow in our humbler way the example of the Eastlakes. Um, she leaves her family, essentially. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, legal hassles about the custody of girls who she leaves with her mother and her husband. They don't get divorced. Uh, the Costello is Catholic, as is Mary at that point, had converted. But they travel the continent with Bernard and Mary's wealthy friend, uh, um, Enrico Costa, and who all goes around with his own art library and while in Venice hires a private gondolier. So they had a very comfortable life there. And Mary and Bernard don't ever live at the first time. They live in various residences, but not at the same house. So this is a floor pan of one of Bernson's, uh, um, um, Bernson, Bernson's house uh, on the Via di Camerata. Uh, which was right next door to Frulino, where Mary was living. And, but Mary and Bernard's relationship did never excluded other obsessions or other relationships. Uh, Mary rather believed in free love at this point, and um, either at the beginning or later in life. So here are some of Mary's obsessions, Herman Ops, uh, Montaigne Jefferson, Jeffrey Scott, Maynard Keynes. Uh, I think she only got to first, beyond first base with Herman Arbist, who was a, a sculptor. 
Um, but, um, and it really shocked Berenson because he had a sort of puritanical uh, bend at this point and uh, was really surprised that she went off with, uh, didn't really go off, but had an affair with this man. Bernard, some of his obsessions. Um, Hortense Seristori, uh, Aline Caroline Sassoon, and Gladys Deacon. And he would particularly fell deeply in love with Aline Sassoon. He said he spent a fortnight in London and all but uh, one night he had, they had dinner together. Kept on writing back to Mary though, he was a little nervous about it, uh, and saying, don't worry, she's just as big as you are. Because Mary at this point had gained quite a bit of weight and I don't know why she would be pleased by this particular comment, but uh, it seemed to have reassured her. But uh, Bernard's great love though, at this point, getting into the uh, 20th century by now, is Belle de Costa Green, uh, who was uh, um, the black American uh, Green, was the librarian to J.P. Morgan. Uh, she was born black, but uh, to be able to hold on to her job, and particularly have this job, she passed this way and added da Costa to her name, which sounded Portuguese possibly to explain some of the, uh, the darker tones of her skin. Um, things happen though. So we have about a decade together and then finally, not finally, because we weren't, they weren't expecting on the 23rd of December, Frank Costello, still quite a young man died. He had a, a, a can't, very quick, uh, cancer. And a year later, Mary and Bernard marry, and they start living under the same roof at, for the first time with the Tati, which was rented. And life there got even more crowded. So here are some of the people. It became a great place to invite people, as it does today, uh, with scholars and uh, guests who come frequently up there. And here are some of the people who I won't read all of their names. And you have to think about it. It reminds me a little bit of that passage of uh, King Lear of how it was. It was a lot of gossip going on. So, you know, who loses, who wins, who's out, who's in sort of discussions happening all the time. Uh, but occasionally there is a, that same passage that you'd say gilded but butterflies or little golden nuggets. And so here is, um, here is Gilbert Murray. Gilbert Murray was a great professor of classics at Oxford. He's a young man at that point. I don't think he was a professor yet. And you probably have read uh, his translations of the Greek classics. And he uh, got into huge discussions with them about what are the authors you should be reading? And finally, at one point, Mary just threw up her hand. She couldn't believe it. he said, Keats is no good. The only English authors worth reading are Chaucer and Shakespeare. Um, so there were, uh, it was an atmosphere of, of a lot of debate, rather repeating the atmosphere of Friday's Hill of her parents' house and the weekends there. What happens though between 1890 and 1900 in the appreciation of Italian art, which is the focus, of course, of both Mary and Bernard's um, relationship. So in 1890, when they were coming to Florence for the first time together, Le Monnier, the publisher, places an ad in La Nazione for the Italian edition of Cavacasselle and Crow's Raphael monograph. And if you read any guidebooks in the 1890s, and they would give a list of books to recommend, they'll always say Crow and Cavacusele, switching around the names for the English. So it's the Englishman is first, or C and C. But by the time of the 1900s, in the Baedekers, it's uh, Baronson's books are being recommended and you don't find Crow and Cavacaselli anymore. So what has happened? Baronson started off and he publishes his first book called The Venetian Painters of the Renaissance. And I made a mistake by saying his first book because it, it's his first book in the sense that he's the only one who signed it, but it was written with Mary, but her husband wouldn't allow her to put her name on it. Um, and these were followed by other volumes on Florence, Central Italy, and North Italy. Here's Berenson's dedication to Mary Logan, which is Mary's pen name on the Venetian 
painters. And I always thought it was kind of offensive because said, with the author's compliments, considering that she wrote a great deal of it. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time he was writing that and actually had hoped to have it come out first, it was his book on Lorenzo Lotto, which was a monograph. It's come out in various editions. This is the um, library at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. The book, he sent the manuscript to their neighbor and great friend, Vernon Lee. This is her portrait by J, uh, John Singer Sargent. And Lee was a very accomplished author herself. I believe her archive is here at the British Institute. And she criticizes Berenson's circular, maze-like style of writing. In fact, it's a little difficult to read nowadays and needed some good editing, and some of which Mary did at that point. And that's her, uh, her um, description of how he is reading uh, one of his books. He did rewrite a good deal of it following up her criticism. They didn't really, their friendship didn't last too long though. Uh, so Mary decides that she's going to take things in hand and she really is organizing how Berenson does his scholarship and her scholarship. So here are her work and materials, all of which are up at the archive of, of Villitati. First of all, rather like the East Lakes, they go on the road a lot. And these are pictures largely from the 1890s and early 1900s um, uh, with them, uh, with, you know, a brownie camera taking snapshots or I was having trouble with cars and things like this or crossing a mountain. But Mary keeps very good diaries and notebooks. And it's really all of these, whereas Bernard doesn't. And it's all of these notebooks which really fed into his publications. Um, and you can see it here. This is a photograph of a painting by Lorenzo Lotto, which is at the um, 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 Carmine in, um, in Venice. And uh, she has very, very um, detailed notes describing the painting says it's clean by ourselves in 1891. In fact, they took some turpentine to try to see whether there was a signature at one point. And that is even things, practical things, to be seen between three or four. Um, uh, uh, she says about these paintings. She also is the one who goes around and looks at the paintings. This is also Lorenzo Lotto. And she makes drawings of them because they don't have photographs at this point. And so she's doing the drawing. Sometimes her drawings aren't too successful, but she's trying hard and she might cross them out and signatures and things like that. Later, as the phototeca, in other words, the photographic collection builds up, which is a very expensive thing to do at that point, uh, she will cross out her notes and cross out her, her drawing because they've purchased the photograph. So they have the photograph and they don't need this anymore. She doesn't cross it out. She did that cross, you could still read the description and everything, but that's an indication it's um, now they own a photograph. And then the, his, all these books, the Venetian paintings, Florentine painters, whatever, went in through several editions. And at the back of the books, they have his famous lists of the, of the various paintings that he attributes to each one of these authors. And this is her notes on the first edition of the Venetian painters, preparing it for the second edition, doing all the updating. You can see how very, very careful she is about um, the editions and, and the things that have to be taken out. This, so, um, this is all being done at the time before their marriage. Towards the end, between uh, 1897 and the early 1900s, Berenson published a series of his articles, but he didn't really publish anything else right then because he was working on the drawings of Florentine painters, really coming to downtown uh, Florence and working the Uffizi archive, Uffizi Gabinato dei Disegni, or also in various uh, um, um, drawings rooms of the museums of Europe. But also at this point, of course, they had gone married and they started renting their house. 
at Itati. And one of the first things that they started thinking about, even before they got married and they had moved in as a couple, was how to decorate. And I'm going to show two examples. And I mean how to decorate in terms of what paintings they would want to have. So the, before this, the Baroness had never been art collectors. He had did, done some small, some dealing. He had sold pictures to Gardner or recommended pictures and things like this, but they hadn't really collected any paintings of their own. And a page of the diary of the, of the poets called Michael Field describes Baron Burns' study at the Villa Kraus, which is another one of their places of, of residence. And all he did was he had photographs of, of prints of, and these are some of the prints of, of some of the paintings that he had prints of scattered around the room. So it's a real scholar, it's not a collector at this point. But once he gets married and it's time to move into Itat, he feels like we have to have proper furniture and we have to have a, a collection. And the first thing he buys is this painting by Domenico Veneziano. I'm not going to get into all the attribution controversies of it, but he, he thought it was by an artist called Baldo Vinetti. Instead, here you see a photograph of him at Itati in front of the painting. It's a famous photograph. He bought this painting uh, in 1899, so still before they moved into Itati. Or maybe it was the first days of 1900. I can't remember. I may have got that wrong. Um, and he bought it from Mariana Palucci delle Roncole, who was a Panciatici Jimenez uh, d'Aragona. She had just inherited all her father's property. Her father was one of the founders of the Bargello Museum and also a great collector of Oriental art and created that fantasy Moorish castle at San Mezzano, which some of you may have seen, which is really worth visiting. Uh, she herself was a scientist and she was um, um, a, a, a expert on mollusks and shells. And, but she found herself all of a sudden having to take care of all this property. And so the first thing that she actually sold, later much of it was sold at auction, was this, that painting um, by uh, Domenico Veneziano. Uh, this is the views of her father's gallery in the Palazzo Jimena Staragona, which is a palazzo on the corner of the Via Giusti and the Borgo Pinti, which had its own oriental museum in it. Hmm which you can see in the lower, um, the lower photograph. All of that was sold at auction, I think around 1907. The second big painting that he bought was this painting, famous painting by Sassetta. And the story of them buying it is rather interesting because apparently at one point, Mary said, we've got to get some chairs for the kitchen. Let's go downtown, the Via de Fossi, find some rigatieri. We can buy some sort of thing. And they go into a shop, actually, I think on the Via de Fossi, which was a shop of the Salvadore family. And they found this large painting by Sassetta, Sini's 15th century artist, who was an artist that Berenson was then studying and wrote an article for in the first, uh, first volume of the new art magazine called the Burlington Magazine. And they, um, this photograph I got from um, Victoria Gondi actually, whose great grandfather was Salvadore, the dealer. And that's actually when we figured out it had came from him. Barrison just said we got a junk shop. Actually, Salvadori was not a junk shop. It was a very fine antiques dealer, largely though not of paintings, but of, of, of furniture and tapestries. And Mary wrote her mother on the 29th of October, 1900. So before they were married or moved in, I, I brought up the enormous picture today in a carriage, a sight for it is about 10 feet tall. It was Mary's money that paid for the picture, not Berenson's. Now I want you to look at this um, photograph of this is the installation as it is today, but they were similar to what it was uh, before um, around 1900. And you will notice that it shows um, the painting of St. Francis and the other saints, but in front of it are Asian, uh, Oriental, Asian works of art, and particularly of, of Buddhism, three Buddhas. And as time went on, and particularly around 1910, a little bit beforehand, Baron St. Bernard, not Mary, became very interested in Asian art. And he had this idea of a global uh, um, 
um, comparison between the arts of Asia and the arts of Europe. And he had that embodied in actuality in the installation of his house by placing these Asian objects in front of, of the Italian art. And he particularly liked the com combination of the Buddha with St. Francis. And he bought other things too. This is not in that photograph, but another one of the most important Buddhists is from Boro, uh, Borobudur, purchased in Paris, I believe. And Mary came there and Mary really hated it. It's so idol-like and so hideous as representation. She was upset to see it, but the thing that she was really concerned with is I'm afraid it's going to knock out all other things to pieces artistically and spiritually. In other words, a collection of early Italian art. Same thing happened with this Han figurine. BB says they're the very essence of art, but if so, they're so essential that they really look like, like nothing at all. We, that's Mary the manservant, laughed and laughed when they opened it up at the crate. When I told BB, he smiled a superior smile in the consciousness of holding the doctrine. Well, Mary did have that trouble with the Asian art at the first, and she was very resistant to it. But as time went on, and particularly, there's the very important show of Islamic art in Munich in 1910. And she went up alone without Bernard to see this exhibition. And uh, she wrote back saying she was completely wrong and that Asian art, which for her would have included Islamic art, Near Eastern art, uh, was indeed good. And it was something that we should have at Itati. And she finally understood it. It's a very important exhibition. Same time, Matisse went there, and here he is in a famous photograph pretending to be at a German beer hall. Um, and at that same point, um, Matisse, uh, Berenson bought from Matisse in 1910 his uh, painting, which is now in Belgrade. It was originally a tut. Okay. Going back now, let's look and finalizing the talk um, coming to the end at the decoration of Itati. So what they did, as I was saying before, is they combined Asian art, there's an old, more historic photograph of the Sasetta with, um, um, with the Buddhas in front of it. And the thing that you notice too, that, that same sort of thing of Asian art and other objects along the shelves there, but also notice that one painting that is leaning over here, leaning against the wall. It was another one of their ways of displaying things, not actually hanging them on the wall. That would have been more common at that point. And this completely goes against the sense of what we would call in American Anglo-Saxon world, the Victorian taste have cleaned things up. So here's a Longfellow house in Cambridge, which has been cleaned up since originally, but you can get the idea of that sort of taste, but also what it was like at the famous Gardner Museum in Boston. And Mary even wrote to her family, but worse of all is her great palace, in spite of the marvelous pictures in it, looks to our now enlightened eyes like a junk shop. Or John G. Johnson's house. That was a great collection. So about that photograph of um, of from Philadelphia, from um, uh, Barron's into the catalog of his pictures too. And Mary told Isabel in 1904, perfectly awful thing is the way his pictures are placed all over the walls and doors, easels, and morning stands. And when you come to Itati uh, and see these historic photographs or go there even now, you can see how the house is arranged around the books and around individual works of art, but in very, very clean lines, no wallpaper. Um, and and uh, it's the, he is responding, both of them, I think, are responding to new ideas of home decoration at that point. And particularly of people like Berenson's friend, Edith Wharton, who wrote in 1897, the decoration of houses. And these are two views of her house in Western Massachusetts, the Mont. Again, see no wallpaper, clean light colors. She co-wrote this with the famous architect decorator Ogden Codman. The upper photograph shows his family home in Lenox, Massachusetts, where the lower 
photograph shows his house on, um, on the Upper East Side in New York. Or Elsie de Wolf. And Elsie de Wolf in 1913 wrote uh, The House in Good Taste. Both these books, The House in Good Taste and The Decoration of the House, belong to Itati. In other words, the Berenson's had these books when they first came out, probably maybe even given by the authors themselves. And I would like to think too that may combine these, some of these ideas for the decoration with the prairie houses of Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, this is a Roberts house of 1908. And you can see how he puts things on shelves, things, leads, things like that. In other views of, of, of different properties of his, you'll see a combination of Asian art with Western art as well, very much upon, um, in the spirit of the Berenson's uh, decoration. Frank Lloyd Wright in 1910 actually was living in Fiesole, but we have no uh, um, record as far as I know that Berenson and the architect um, ever met. So I've talked about this and everyone's talking about, oh, Berenson and his picture dealing, things like this, but I'd like to emphasize that the purchase of all those pictures and all, most of those works of art before, all happened before he drew up his secret contract with Joseph Duveen in which he got a cut on some pitch, pictures that he recommended largely to rich American collectors. So Itati was formed before this happened. Mm -hmm. The Duveen earnings, you might say, went into the library. And I, I don't like to be critical of Barris and his picture dealing. Everyone says, oh, what do you think about the morality of it? I think the morality of it is that we have the Villa Itati in this great uh, library because he, uh, he uh, did do that and earned a lot of money on that. This is a view of the library. I'm going to um, essentially end here, except to say that the Baronsons of World War II, one, the Great War comes, the Baronsons donate uh, money for the uh, uh, X-ray machine for the ambulance to the Red Cross of Fiesole. This is not that photograph. It shows, shows Vigevano, in which they were hoping two occasions that they could X-ray a few paintings at one point for research purposes. And um, at this point, Baron uh, Mary's children, Karen and uh, Ray, get married. They marry into Bloomsbury aristocracy, where you might say. Uh, Karen married uh, Adrian Stephen, who was uh, Virginia Woolf's bro brother, and uh, Ray married a stray sheep. Um, and uh, Berenson, I always couldn't stand that well. He called Bloomsbury Gloomsbury. Um, but Mary uh, really began to enjoy her, her, her grandchildren. And uh, Berenson began to become very critical of Mary in these years, not because she liked her grandchildren and enjoyed being with them, but she, he thought that her devotion to her family at this point, her willingness, her, her desire to spend a lot of time, particularly in England where the grandchildren were growing up, was taking her away from what her, was her true vocation, was working as an art historian. At, but Berenson himself, I had, emphasized was not against children. He really liked his, his uh, step-grandchildren and great-grandchildren in this case. And here's a lovely photograph of him with one of them and Mary as well. But I'd like to end a little bit by coming back to the works of art because I think both Mary and Bernard's way of looking at works of art so affected uh, the 20th century view of the Italian Renaissance. And since they went to see uh, Botticelli's for the first time when they were here in Christmas Eve, 1890, why don't we go back to the uh, uh, Galleria dell'Accademia and look at the birth of Venus in Berenson's eyes. Take the lines that render the movements of the tossing hair in the birth of Venus. This kind of line has a power of stimulating our imagination and of directly communicating life. Very much Berensonian take on a picture like that. How about Mary on the Primavera? Mary, went down to the academy on the 9th of February, 1907. And she wrote in her diary, 
Bernard Redo was reading over his texts of his North Italian, so he was working hard at home. Whereas I went to town and saw the Primavera, suddenly remembering it was the exact time that Ray and her friends were marching the women's suffrage procession from Hyde Park to Exeter Hall. The two worlds seemed to clash, but I love my Venus haunted grove best, which is very unstrenuous and immoral of me. But did the two worlds clash? And I think Mary B, how, why was she reminded of the suffrage? You look at, uh, oh, excuse me, this is the march, uh, the advertisement for it, a photograph of it. There's Ray in those years. One of the speakers of the march was Lady uh, Strachey, who would later become her mother in law. But and here's the march. So, why did Mary, why was Mary reminded of the march looking at the Primavera? obviously because of the white gowns of the woman um, of, of the three graces or whoever he wished to interpret them reminds them of the suffragettes costume at that time. And um, it's kind of interesting that Mary is able to extract out of these wonderful Renaissance paintings, a bit of her very personal experience. And I think she tells us maybe a much more contemporary way of thinking about these paintings than perhaps uh, the ones that we read in Bernard's of um, works on the painters of the Renaissance. So I thank you for listening to me this evening. Okay, well, thanks so much to Carl for that really fascinating insight to the Barisons. I certainly learned a huge amount, which I didn't know before. Um, so as always, we'll, I'm just going to put a little bit of light so you can see what we're doing. Now. Yes, better. Um, as always, we'll um, open it up for questions, comments um, from both the people in the room and also those on the Zoom. Um, the way we do it is if you're in the room and want to say something, just put your hand up and I'll bring you the microphone. Please use the microphone so the people on the Zoom can hear the question. Uh, and if you're on the Zoom and want to intervene, there's two ways. You can either put something in the chat and I'll read it out on your behalf. Uh, or if you want to talk to us direct, just wave and get my attention by putting your video on. And then we'll, I'll invite you to unmute and talk direct to us. We can hear you in the room. So um, opening up for questions and comments now. Anyone in the room or on the Zoom? The floor is yours. Yes, uh, Christine, I'll bring you the microphone. What and how did they find these statues? Mm -hmm. well, what and how did they find these statues? The question was when and how they bought Itati. Itati was bought several years after they um, started living there, I think um, 1907, and uh, they, got, they took out a loan. <laughs> from like a lot of people do. <laughs> very, very, very straightforward, really. Um, I'm just going to open up the chat in case we've got something there. Um, and anybody uh, on the Zoom wants to go or more in the room? Do I see any hands? Um, yeah, I've got one more in the room here. Thank you so much. Um, I was very fascinated by the picture you showed us with the set down the previous. Um, did he write anything about those stories? Yes, uh, Berenson, uh, um, in 1903 in the Burlington Magazine, he wrote a, um, a, a long article about Sassetta in which he made lots of comparisons to Buddhist, what he called Buddhist art, which was largely Chinese painting of the Buddhist of the Buddha and or Buddhist themes and made quite a number of comparisons about that. Later in the 1920s, he wrote, he republished that article and he wrote a very fascinating introduction to it. He kind of apologized, he kind of realized that was probably not a very uh, art historically correct comparison, but he said it was a time in which um, there was so much interest in Asian art and so much interest in Buddhism and, and Franciscanism that it came to him at that point. And so we a back. We've got, well, before we do that, we've got one come up on the comments um, from Lawrence uh, Bass. 
um, did Edith Wharton's anti-Semitic attitudes interfere with her relationship with Bernard Berenson? <laughs> Well, that, that, that's probably a very good question, but it, of course it wasn't part of my talk. But I, um, Berenson uh, was used to anti-Semites. I'll just say that. What did you say? I, I said he he was very used to anti-Semites. Oh. So. Uh, Thank you very much for the talk. I know it's a little bit off topic, but who was who was behind the big garden? Was it Bernard or was it Mary? Who's the big gardener? And did they collect sculpture for the garden as well as in their art collection? One of the first, the first questions was about how they bought Itati. The garden uh, and the real development of the garden came after they bought Itati, and it was done by Cecil Pisson. Uh, who was a great uh, Englishman who did design a lot of gardens in um, in and around Florence and Tuscany. And um, it was kind of the Anglo-Italian garden, you might say, um, though I believe it was the first example and it was um, um, Mary Bernard Berenson who hired him. Yes. Um, before we take another question, I'm just going to put in my weekly reminder to those who have joined us by Zoom. Um, we are happy to give free access to these lectures on Zoom, but we do ask you to make a, a donation if you can. Any amount that you're comfortable with is most welcome and it helps to keep us going. It's worth just reminding people, because not everyone knows this, that the British Institute of Florence is a, a, an independent charity based in Florence, which receives absolutely no funding whatsoever from the British or Italian government or any other public sources. And so we entirely survive on our wits and, and the contributions of our patrons. Um, weekly request for donations done. So more questions um, or comments, please, from the room or in the Zoom. Is anyone on the Zoom who'd like to... Uh, Mark, why don't you unmute yourself and let's talk to us. Yes. Um... Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Um, Carl, th fantastic lecture, absolutely wonderful, huge amount of detail. I, I, I shall have to watch it in order to absorb it all. Um, one, one thing I wanted to ask you was, um, how do you know that Berenson didn't like, to, did, didn't object to children? I always heard he, he claimed to be the president of the Heron Club. <laughs> right. You mean you're saying that I said he didn't like children? Well, no, I thought you said that he that he didn't mind them. No, he didn't. I don't think he. Well, I didn't. I don't think he minded the children of his of his his step grandchildren, okay. or, or or his stepdaughters. I don't know about children in general, um, but. Um, he actually seemed to get along with them. He did at one point get very uh, mad, but she was already an adult with Karen um, um, Stevens and Adrian Stevens uh, because um, they were pacifists during the First World War. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Um, any more in the room on the Zoom? I, I've actually got one, which is, uh, and I'll come to you, Josh Hopkins. Um, I was thinking when you showed the juxtaposition of the Buddhist art and, and the, the Florentine Renaissance art, I was thinking very much about a similar activity that Howard Acton was doing up at uh, La Pietra, because Howard Acton, of course, became uh, very interested in Chinese art and lived in China for five or six years uh, um, just before the Second World War. Um, and there's a lot of Chinese uh, and other art up at uh, La Pietra. Uh, did Barrison and Acton know each other? And were they in having a dialogue around those sorts of things? Um, the well, the Asian art at the Villa La Pietra comes in two different generations. So the uh, the uh, ceramics and the porcelain comes from uh, Harold Acton's parents' generation, wow. and Berenson did indeed know them, as he did indeed know Harold Acton, um, who was from a different generation, and his um, collecting of. Asian art came at you know several decades later. I don't know if they actually talked much about that. I have a feeling 
that at that point, a lot of their talk would have been social gossip, yeah. I'm afraid to say. Yes, though I don't know how deep a friendship he had with the, uh, the first act and so on. Carl, I want to know what was the choice of Berenson? Where did Berenson, the name Berenson, come? And oh. because he wasn't, it was Berenson. Yeah, Volodensky. Volodensky. So where did that come from? Uh, Berenson was it was born in with the Russian Empire, in other words, which was part of present day Lithuania. Uh, and uh, his, uh, they immigrated to America in 1875. His father lost a lumber business. He was a, uh, had a business in wood and um, lumber, essentially, and it burned down. And uh, there was, uh, he decided that he would um, have to immigrate to America under certain amount of pressure too from uh, the, their relatives, because uh, he decided he believe, began to believe in secular uh, Judaism, and he came to America. And like a lot of people from Eastern Europe, uh, the name was changed on arrival. I don't know how they. I personally don't know if someone might how they picked out Berenson as opposed to any other name. Bernard's first name was spelled with an H, which is a more German way of spelling it, but then with the First World War, like the Battenbergs and <laughs> other families with German sounded names, they changed it, they dropped the H. Any other students that go one more in the room? Oh, okay, so there was somebody here, and we've got three in the room. Thank you. It was so fascinating, it was so rich. I was wondering whether this is a period where a lot of the uh, where cultural anthropology and is being established in America and England at that time. And I was wondering whether uh, whether either Bernard or Mary or both were interested at all in really thinking also about cultural objects or about or whether they were following all this or the, all this new thinking that was happening at the time at all. Um, in relation to comparing cultures and arts and so on. Uh, I can maybe answer that halfway. I think that Barron's interest in religion and all religions, whether they're Eastern religions, um, South Asian religions, um, Catholicism, Protestantism, Judaism, uh, made him sometimes think about objects in deeply religious terms. So I think his primary um, reaction to them was um, more aesthetic. Uh, I'm a little less certain about Mary. One of the nice things, of, to, ways of answering your question would be actually looking in the library and looking to see if some of the books and, and, and studies were read, uh, read by them or owned by them about that. Okay, I, I, before there's two more in the room, but before I go, there's a bit more happening on the Zoom. Um, so some comments. Um, a little bit more, please, about the last photo with the suffragettes and Primavera. Um, Iris Arrigo says she was very nice to her when she was a young teenager. Uh, so there you go. Uh, and from Michael Francis, thank you. Could you tell us a little bit about any relationship between Berenson and Stefano Baldini? So I'll let you do those three, and then we'll go to uh, Julia, who's got a hand up after that, and then we'll go, come back to it. Could I explain the last photograph of the suffragists next to Bocelli's Primavera? Well, I just happened to say that when uh, Mary went to see uh, the Primavera on the same day that Ray was marching in London and was later became known as the Mud March, looking at the Primavera reminded her of the suffragists. Um, so looking at the picture brought up this uh, thing. Iris Arrigo says that he was very nice to her when she was a young teenager. I was happy to know that. <laughs> I know they were very good. Uh, they became friends. As, as what, uh, after Barrison died, there's a, a, um, 
Rai Italian television documentary about him in which there's a wonderful interview with Iris Arrigo, which you can probably find on YouTube or various places. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the, any relationship between Berenson and Stefano Bardini? Um, I think, I, I, I'm not sure, they knew each other. He, he went to see pictures and things like this. I'm, I'm not sure how deep a relationship that was though. Um, um, so I can't really answer that in full. Um, we might get some insight into that uh, in April when Lynn Cato was coming to give us a talk all about um, Bardini, which will be really, really interesting one to watch out for. Um, uh, Julia, you had your hand up patiently. Why don't you unmute right. the pictures? Right. I've got a story about Berenson and a child. Um, my Florentine landlord, when I first came to Florence, told me that when he was a boy during the war, uh, he was playing in the garden, uh, sneaked in, and the gardener caught him and dragged him by the ear to Bernard Berenson and to report him to be punished. And Bernard Berenson said, has he damaged anything? And the gardener said, no. And so Bernard Berenson said, well let him play and that garden is so beautiful I got invited to lunch by Louise Club when she was director there and I made the mistake of going up through the garden and it was just like being in paradise it was so exquisite so I can see how this boy uh, treasured that memory of playing in the garden instead of being in the violence that was taking place in the city of Florence which he saw firsthand. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay, have we got two more in the room. There's one here and one in the back. Um, okay. Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah. um, I was struck by your comment about the uh, um, uh, Buddhist head and the art behind it, the Renaissance art. Um, what influence do you think? Uh, the Picasso, the whole modern French movement and inter, well, the general modernist movement in African art, the primal uh, mass development that was happening and the um, absorption of African art into modern art might have had on Berenson and his appreciation of the Asian primal sort of art relative to that one. Of course, they're very rather, rather parallel things because artists like Matisse and Picasso obviously were very interested in African art at that time. Berenson did not collect African art. And I don't know how good his library books that he himself bought was on African art. So I'm a little uh, lost to, um, to answer that part of your question. He was interested in, he, he had met Picasso, actually Gertrude Steins in Paris, as he had met um, Matisse and many of the artists of that period. And later in life, uh, when there was post-war, uh, Second World War, when there was a great Picasso show at the Palazzo Reale in Milan and also in, in Roma, uh, he went several times to see it. So he, he was, Fast, and he wrote about it for the Corriere de la Sera. So he's fascinated by uh, these artists of nearly his same generation uh, at that point. Um, he had generally negative comments about Picasso, but the relationship between modernism and African art, I don't know. Okay, um, thank you very much, Sean. We're, I think we're coming towards the end. Um, just see if okay is there, if anyone on the zoom would like one last chance to intervene please do so now likewise in the room if there's any last thoughts or comments or questions i think coming up for half past seven we've probably run the natural course of this evening's uh, really excellent lecture so on behalf of all of you i'd just like to finish by thanking carl very much indeed thank you Uh, Buona sera to tutti al Zoom, and we'll see you all next week. And for those in the room, I'm so sorry, the current 
norme in vigore prohibit us from uh, serving wine. And I think we're hoping it will change soon, but for now, we just aren't allowed.